So although I'm talking about responsible technology, I don't actually like the phrase responsible technology very much. Technology is an object, and it can't be responsible. People are responsible. So I think about how we can make the tech industry, everyone who develops technology more responsible, and how we can change practice in how we do tech. But it's a lovely hashtag. So nearly 11 years ago now, I shipped a connected home system. This was it, alert me. And we tried to do the right thing. It was a security product, and we thought about what would happen if the network failed. We thought about how to secure the system and do sensible key exchange. We thought very hard about how people sell stuff on eBay later on, and we wanted to design in a system that would cover all those use cases. And it's been really frustrating for me ever since, seeing all the numerous consumer IoT products developed that actually are less good. Systems for a home that assume only one person lives there and need to control them. Systems that break when the network coverage isn't perfect. Dreadfully insecure systems meant for use in the most intimate parts of our lives. How could we as a sector forget what we knew 11 years ago, which was not that complicated to do then? We stopped doing what was right. And there's so many examples of irresponsible technology development now, particularly but not exclusively in IoT, right? Devices with no plan for how to keep them operating over time, insecure products, biased machine learning, or what might even be worse, machine learning systems that promise far more than they can deliver, um, or even in some cases being worse than the manual equivalents that they replace. And the fear and distrust that is coming from the Silicon Valley backlash is not only going to affect Silicon Valley, it will affect all of us. So don't imagine that just because people still use Facebook that they like it and trust it, you can distrust things you still use. But the tech industry as a whole needs to do better. We need to do better, and we need to be seen to do better. People look to the developers and operators of technology to act responsible, to be honest about what they do, so that we can have confidence in the products and services that now permeate all parts of our lives. When the IoT and the sort of gadgets that we love were just toys, this was less of an issue, but now they're everywhere. And we definitely need to think about this is more than just personal information and privacy as well. Responsibility is more holistic. And this is the time for it. The tech industry is maturing now, and like other sectors, as they mature, it's a time for reflection, for stabilization, for building good practice. And it's going to be a culture shift, because already for a young industry, we've embedded practice in what we do and how we think. And it's going to need a change in the relationships between the tech industry, governments and society, and the dynamics around that, and how we think about value and what good looks like. But building technology responsibly is simply what we should be doing in big corporates and small startups, in nonprofits and communities, in toys and tools and products and platforms. So at Dot Everyone, I started exploring what technology might look like in 2016. What does good look like? What does bad look like? Everyone talks about data and privacy, and these days they talk about machine learning as well, but that's just right now the hype cycle we're in. It's not the whole of responsibility. So a few quick points about how Dot Everyone's been thinking about this. So we're defining responsible tech based on our values as an organization, a European organization. So these are not global values. These are not the values of Silicon Valley or of China, for instance. And it's also worth noting that we don't actually talk about ethics. Ethics are very personal, they're very culturally specific, and they change with time. And so many of the issues also that frustrate us with technology products today are not really about ethics. It's just straightforward bad practice. And not everyone wants to see responsible technology in practice, not just theoretical frameworks that can stack up on our bookshelves. And believe me, there are a lot of those. I read dozens and dozens of ethical tech manifestos and oaths and pledges last year. That's nice, but we need stuff in practice, so we have to start moving on from the theory. And also at Dot Everyone, we take a systems perspective. It's not about specific tech niche fields. My fitness tracker is a wearable, it's IoT, it's a mobile app, it's machine learning, it's a cloud service. Responsibility cuts across those technology domains. So apologies for the slide, it has way too many words on it. <laughs> so 
At the start of 2017, I defined this as the 10 aspects of responsible technology, the landscape of things we can be thinking about when we think about responsibility. There's overlaps here. Um, some are more about technology, some are more about the business itself. But those two are interlinked, and interlinked intrinsically. You can't separate out the stuff you do with data and the stuff you do with money. They are connected. And there's a lot hidden in these headlines. For instance, standards and best practice elides over a whole bunch of specific things depending on what sector you work in, what product or service type you're making. And the idea is to show different parts of a technology developing organization the different things that could be impacting their overall responsibility and to raise awareness of areas where you might be able to improve. So some of these may seem really obvious to you, such as making usable and understandable products, but these are not obvious to everybody, as it turns out. There are many developers who are not in this sort of community who simply don't think like that. I was talking to someone who I, from a local tech industry community that, near where I live, who I won't name, and he was saying, user-centric design, in fact, just thinking about users at all, isn't something that community really does. It just hasn't got to them yet. And so we need to think about, you know, all these different people. Not everyone thinks like us. Not everyone has our training and our cultural background. And for me, and the engineering training that I've received and the cultures I've worked in are just fundamentally different to that. To me, it's obvious to do these things, but it's not obvious to everyone else. We need to remember the kind of hidden diversity in tech, not just the forms of diversity we can see, but the different things about where people come from. And some of these have the potential to be quite radical, too. Talking about business model and organizational ownership and control and what might be responsible and appropriate for a given product, that's a little bit different. It's much easier if you're starting out with a new venture than it is in an existing structure. But it does imply that you think about things like where investment comes from and what you would give back in exchange for that investment and what that might mean. Fair reward for contributions of labor or data do the people who supply data for your service get fair value in return? If you use public data sources, do you give back? Do you file bug reports against public data sets? And what do you do for the open source libraries that you depend on? Are you contributing back to those as well? Do you fairly compensate people who might be providing micro labor, whether that's through Mechanical Turk or clicking through captures to get into your service? Are they getting value for that? So these are quite radical and unusual thoughts. So there is some subtlety in here. Um, your product may, for instance, never be understandable to the people who use it. Our technology products are very complicated, and it's not reasonable to expect every person on the street to understand them. But maybe you can be clear and honest to those consumers. Maybe you can be understandable to the consumer rights groups, the consumer advocacy groups who might review your product and recommend it for use. Perhaps you can be open and transparent for the regulators in your country who need to be able to say, you know, that, that's what good looks like. We want to see more of that in this market. So think about who you're targeting with this. And there is no one correct answer for any of these things. It's not a standard, a set of boxes you tick. It's more about thinking about these things, avoiding the worst things, and striving to do better on each of them, doing good where you can, and being honest and open about what you can and can't do in a business. So these are some sort of dot everyone perspectives on the issues of responsibility. It's a scale. There are many trade-offs. You can always do better. There is no perfect here. Complexity is there, and we have to embrace it. Tech is complex. Our wider world where technology is embedded is complex. And we need to be more sophisticated in how we talk about some of these issues, to recognize their gray areas, to recognize the trade-offs between responsibility and other important parts of our business and accepting there's always going to be tensions in what we do. We won't always get it right, but we can keep trying and get better. Mostly, people don't want to cause harm to other people, so if given the opportunity to reflect and raise a concern, people will be responsible, up to a point, as we'll see. And this is about industry transformation, right? So people have always evolved and changed how they work, and this is no different. We just need to embed some new practices into how we work as a sector. And that requires long-term commitment, great leadership, which is visible and inspiring and interesting, common language and understanding, and enthusiastic and smart people who want to learn. 
And conveniently, in tech, we've always said that we're smart and enthusiastic and want to learn, so this should be really easy to land this with everyone. And finally, we do get benefits from this, right? Technology is awesome, and if we do it responsibly and introduce it in a considered way, it's going to be even more awesome. But how do we start to move the dial so there is no perfect level of responsibility? Even if you're working on an incredible project in tech for good and sustainable development or humanitarian aid with amazing stakeholder engagement, you probably won't get everything right. And it's worth noting, it's actually harder sometimes to criticize or support projects like that than it is to, say, to criticize Facebook. Projects that are struggling with limited resources and hard problems um, won't get everything right. And it's kind of off-putting to go and say, you know, you know what, you've got a real privacy hole in what you're doing, you should fix it. It's really tough, and we need to find ways to have those constructive conversations, even with projects we feel bad about critiquing. But most importantly, the devil in all of this is in the details. These are gray areas. There is no black and white. And so we need to also learn to listen to people who are describing the problems they face as they develop technology and empathize and help them, and not just to sort of throw rocks at things that are bad. At the same time, we should recognize that tech is full of, you know, people trying to get rich quickly, and even criminals, right? We hope they don't dominate the sector, but such people always cluster around power, and the tech industry is where power is right now. So some of these are big questions to think about. Is your company's business model responsible? Are you giving fair value back? And some of these things are small questions, like whether you actually implement that security feature or comply with the voluntary standard, when that might, say, delay your ship date and put off revenue or lose you a funding round. So this isn't easy, right? These are complicated questions, particularly for small businesses where their existence of their organization might be on the line. So it's tough, but it's important. People's experience with technology affects their whole lives now. It changes how they feel about the internet and how they feel about us as technology developers and the people who make tech generally. So everyone recently ran a nationally, a nationally representative survey in the UK to find out how people felt about technology. So I'm going to make it a bit more interactive. How many of you feel the internet has made your life better? Put your hand up if you think the internet has made your life better. Okay, and now hand up if you think the internet has made your life worse. Interesting. Okay. Well, to everyone, we found that you know, generally people felt it was pretty good. But then we asked them how they felt it had affected society. And results were not quite so good. So we're doing well for individuals, but not so great for people collectively. And people want technology that's useful for them, that has benefits that outweigh the harms. But a lot of what we do today optimizes for the individual, not for the collective, the community. We can't rely on scandals to help us getting better. We're going to have to work at it day to day. So we need a systems change approach. The different players in the tech ecosystem whose actions you can help affect how we design and develop technology. And bear in mind as I go through the next section that some actions are going to be appropriate on different timescales. So there's things that where change can be quick and there's things where change is necessarily slow. So people power with thinking about the voice of the customer. And first of all, one of the things we can do here is help people build digital understanding. Not digital skills, not the practical tools they need to use stuff, but a critical understanding of what the internet does to them. And that gets us a little bit of the way. It helps people understand. But it doesn't necessarily help people choose better technology. Because we have to remember that people lead busy, complicated, and messy lives. And it's a lot to ask them to choose something that may be slightly more expensive, or slightly less convenient in the cause of responsibility. And so not everyone has unlimited money and time and energy. Not everyone is ever going to be a digital hipster carefully, you know, buying their fair phones, paying for their apps, fiddling with open source. So we have to think about people overall and their ability to engage with this. And that means thinking about collective action. How can we empower civil society organizations who represent and group people to demand and use better technology and to push back on technology that's bad for people today, to, you know, to raise complaints and so on? Then we come to the people who make technology, and we venerate technical teams, right? We obsess over heroic technology leaders, the Zuckerbergs and the Musks and so on. But we need to remember that with great power comes great responsibility. 
Now, we heard yesterday that personal ethics of the makers of technology might drive change in how responsible we are. And we've heard here that there's more awareness of tech ethics than there ever was before. But I'm a little skeptical. I don't think that that is going to significantly move the dial on the way we develop responsible technology. Because you have to know what to do, what responsible looks like. And then you have to do something about it. Do you challenge your manager when they ask you to do something that looks like bad practice? Or if they keep saying, you know, no, do this thing, do you eventually quit? You know, or do you ship the insecure product because that's what your company needs to keep going and survive? These are not easy decisions. And even if you care and you know what good looks like, many people don't, right? Many engineers haven't had any social science training or even design training. They need tools and practices to help them navigate this space and figure out what, you know, what good looks like and then figure out if they can do anything about that. I'll come on to the tools we're developing at .everyone in a bit. So we've also thought about you know, Google workouts, you know, the power of a workforce as a whole. And again, I'm skeptical because I think while tech workers have a lot of privilege in Silicon Valley, not everyone can turn down that big salary. Not everyone can walk away from a big salary either. There's also an interesting question about education. People say, well, we should give our, ethic, you know, our tech workers some ethics training, maybe in university. Well, not everyone goes through university who ends up working in digital. Um, perhaps we instead want people to develop and demonstrate high standards through professional certification, like in other engineering sectors, and annual checks and things. I'm very weird in that I'm a chartered engineer, so I actually do this, but I don't see tech jobs caring about that yet. My career is clearly very unusual because I weight heavily working on things I believe in and I'm willing to pay out the sums of money for my annual certification. But business models drive what happens in business. They create the culture that supports and motivates more or less responsible behavior. And there's business certifications like B Corps and so on that can help force change through an organization with audits to avoid ethics washing. And businesses are also tech customers, so they can demand better technology from their suppliers. They want to manage risk and non-responsible technology, irresponsible technology, it's a risk. Investors are also worth thinking about. If you're building hardware, you need risk capital. And that means, what are you going to offer in exchange for that capital? What are you going to give back? What do your investors expect? Funding doesn't have to come from VCs. It can come from the state. It can come in different ways. There's crowdfunding as well. And I'm actually really encouraged here because I see a new community of investors arising who aren't interested in an exit, which really changes the dynamics of a company. But they want to see a return on profit. They want to see a share of profit later on, that sort of thing. So look at stewarded capital, the indie VC movement, and that sort of thing. It's really encouraging. And finally, bold policy making. Not the kind of regulation that stifles innovation that everyone complains about, but thoughtful demanding of the use of open standards, actions to stop people from dominating markets. Regulation does not have to be slow, ill-informed about technology. There's a lot of really good regulation coming now, innovative regulation using sandboxes, hiring or seconding technical expertise. And I should say I've heard people here at ThingsCon complaining about regulation in tech and complaining about government not understanding tech. Um, but I think that's down to us. We should be helping our governments. If you think that they're being too slow and don't understand what's going on, go help. Offer your services. Go and work in government or the public sector, because it's only through good technologists actually standing up and helping them get up to speed that we can make change. Go be a public interest technologist. Work in civil society as well. Try to understand the challenges and pressures that government and the public sector face. Don't just moan that government seems slow and tech is fast. Society is slow too, and that's just how it is. So Dot Everyone's been working on how to improve industry practice for a while, doing some prototyping with businesses to see what tools we can give them to try to actually improve practice. We've refined the 10 aspects I showed you into three punchy areas, hopefully. Um, and this is the model which we are now integrating into development processes, both short-term, like agile cycles, and longer-term business review processes. So just to quickly spin through these, context, thinking about the bigger picture of how and where and when technology is used, 
It can be useful to think about this in different lenses, and we give people tools to do this, like inclusive design personas and contextual user journeys, tools that many technologists may not actually have thought about before. In consequences, what might happen when your technology is out in the world? Not just things going wrong, but maybe things going right. Like if you come to dominate your market, you might actually find that your factory lets you down or you can't scale your support teams. You have to think holistically about this. And there are several ways to think about this as well. Effects on the environment of energy and materials, resilience and security. There's nothing worse than an IoT system going offline because of a network error, as many people found yesterday in the UK when O2 went down. And contribution, considering all the ways that people are giving value to the product and sharing value. Ideally, well, first of all, we want to see people being open about the contributions that are made. And secondly, ideally, being fair as well. So we've created this structured model. We're prototyping them with businesses. And we found that reflection and a framework is really helpful, even for organizations that have been ethical and responsible in their work from the start and really strongly identify with that. And we're now developing that into tools for businesses, which means we have to sell this idea to businesses. We have this kind of business sales pitch because we have to tell people who don't believe in responsibility or ethics that this is actually something that will affect their bottom line and their profits. So it's about risk mitigation, which companies understand, and crisis management because no one wants to be like Facebook. Facebook's had plenty of problems this year. And we're thinking about these different ways that we can start to land these ideas. And different messages work well for different businesses. Some like to talk about recruitment. Some want to talk about new innovation. Um, and we're starting to build evidence that responsible behavior can help in each of these areas as well. Because we have to get in at the board, at the C-suite, at the leaders of companies, to show them that there's something here that's worth investing in to make it easier for the engineers in those companies and the designers to actually make change. And aside from that business process change, I think there's a lot we can do as engineers and designers and leaders to pursue meaningful projects and to explore what this means, to talk about the hard stuff. But I still want to, I wanted to put this up as I saw this yesterday because a lot of what we see as irresponsible is due simply to the motivations and incentives that we have in a capitalist economy, in business, you know? So while we can motivate motivated individual contributors to work to higher standards, there's still a challenge of the environment we work in. We're going to need to change what we measure and what we value in technology and show alternative ways of operating, different forms of value, showing the value of supporting society, healthy and thriving communities and the environment, and prioritizing those human values, not just optimizing for efficiency and cost. Because responsibility isn't a free lunch. It is probably going to take some work and some sacrifice. An organization struggling between good user experience and the viral effects their investors want to see to give highest growth. It's tough, because if you don't deliver what your investors want, you'll close down. These are not easy decisions at all. It's much easier if you're setting up a new organization, I should say, because you can embed the right values from the start. But it's hard if your competitor is moving fast and breaking things to kind of sit back and say, it's okay, we're not breaking stuff, we're just going a bit slower, we're doing it right. Now, I could make a case that this is because of capitalism, which has some particularly insidious effects where network effects of technology interact with risk capital and the incentives for growth. But we can't sit around and wait for the end of capitalism to sort this problem out. We've got to start designing for individual community and society needs right now um, and think about what we can do. My example here, by the way, is usually Uber. Uber is great for me as an individual. It's cheap and convenient rides. But for everyone as a whole, it adds to congestion. And we can start to make small steps towards a better future without having that totally utopian vision ever achievable, because I don't think it will be. We're never going to have the magical open source fair universe we don't like, but we can make steps towards it. So we can think about how we can design organizations more thoughtfully. We can build social enterprises and cooperatives and hybrid models like nonprofits and trusts to make tech more equitable and more responsible. Some of us are going to be radical pioneers at the edges, trying crazy new things, and others are going to be changing existing organizations, learning from those who moved ahead. And we're going to need a little bit of both, right? We're also going to have people who do much less radical things, but who change larger organizations just a little bit, and who can still can actually enable really large-scale change. The movement's going to have a lot of people in it. 
We can do better sometimes with some really basic common sense of just thinking through risks and planning sensibly. If you're making a lock, think that people might attack it with a screwdriver. You know, incidents like this affect the perception of tech as a whole. They don't just affect that lockmaker. So we need to get better at calling out stupid mistakes early on with a mixture of critique and support, helping each other to build better projects and learning together and demonstrating what good design looks like for people who might otherwise just not encounter it. There's using standards. There's tools and processes to make it more straightforward and making the case for thinking about communities and society. I think there's a lot we can do for championing good examples as well. We need more of us building connected products responsibly and showing that we can build successful businesses around them, big or small. So we're not alone, right? The Zebra movement, if you haven't seen it, do check it out. I love their concept as pictured here that zebras are fixing what unicorns break. And I think they share many values. So with us, we're a bit more techie. Zebras are not all techie, but it's very similar. We can't engineer people's trust, but we can engineer trustworthy products and systems. We can have them competently made, honest and reliable about what they do. And that's something we can each contribute to. So to come back to the question I was posed, what's the meaning of responsible technology? It's a cultural shift in technology. It's away from moving fast and breaking things, away from heroes disrupting sectors, away from innovation for the sake of innovation. It means building useful products that help people in their communities. It means being part of the wider world, being humble, listening to other people and designing for them and society overall with empathy. And it's not going to be perfect, right? Here I am, I've got a fair phone. Fairphone admit this is not a fair phone, but it's better. It's better than the alternatives. And when you see good, responsible technology, tell people. Don't just tell each other in this connect community. Tell your neighbors and your family and your friends. Tell your political you know, representatives. Tech doesn't have to be like Silicon Valley. We can build something better with European values and responsibility. You've got to show them what good looks like. And all kinds of products that we're making today are not going to work out or they'll go a different way to what we think. We're mostly in Europe, I think we have European values, and I don't think enough people here in Europe, outside this room, have any idea that we are pioneering responsible technology, that there is a different way. So I think we need to start talking about that more. We're not all Silicon Valley. Responsible technology exists, and it's wonderful. So support each other, build good responsible technology, and champion it when you see it, and let's make responsible technology the new normal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's, there's one topic that I would very briefly like to comment and ask you something about. Um, you ask companies, individuals and designers to make responsible technology, but uh, obviously there's also a really big role, you mentioned it as well, for regulators, oversight, um, new policies. And, and, and we're at a moment in time where even the big companies are asking for policies. I mean, even yesterday, Brad Smith of Microsoft asked for you know, regulation of yep. face recognition. And Tim Cook of Apple has said, we have to regulate privacy. We have to start doing this. But there seems to be a huge difference between the European approach with trust and oversight, the American approach, which is less trust and oversight. And the UK is breaking away from Europe. Where, where does that leave us? I mean... I have no idea what the UK is doing. No. No one else seems to know <laughs> None of us do, right? Yeah. I think we still will share European values, and I think there are lots of people working around Europe in many civil society groups and activist groups trying to get good regulation through it. I would really encourage you to get involved. I think the voice of technologists and designers in policy activism is still really small. But informed voices, you can make a huge difference to a tiny digital rights group which is campaigning in your country or in Europe as a whole by adding your voice, by sending you know, 50 euros, tiny amounts, or by taking the time to go talk to your political representatives about the tech issues that matter to you. You know, we need more informed tech voices. Many other people can't do this. We can. So you've got to step up, right, and get involved. Um, and I think there is change coming, both within Europe as a whole and within individual countries. There is an interest in regulating. So now is the time to get involved with your local civil society groups. And they're out there. Every European country has groups fighting for what I would describe as responsible tech, yeah. whether it's privacy or cybersecurity or you know, potential loss of jobs due to automation, all kinds of things. And they would love to have more help from techies. So we should get out there and get involved. Thank you very much.